Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sullivan, and it is my privilege to welcome you to our webinar today, Using the Parish Website to Power Adult Faith Formation. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started. First of all, please note that your microphones, if you have one, are muted. This will be an audio-only webinar, but you will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end of the presentation. In your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll find a question box where you can type in your questions. Feel free to do that at any point during the presentation, but we will be taking the questions at the end. If your control panel has closed, you can always reopen it to get to that box by clicking on the orange arrow button, which you should see on your screen. One other thing, if you're following along on Twitter today, we encourage you to uh, tweet about the presentation. Uh, please use the hashtag WebAFF to mark your tweets, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, engage in some of those uh, later on this afternoon after we're done with the presentation. I'd like to start my webinar today, as I like to start all my webinars, with a brief prayer. Uh, this prayer is actually the collect from the new Mass for the New Evangelization. Uh, if you haven't seen that new Mass, it was put out last year and is available on the official Year of Faith website. Uh, it's a, a wonderful option for celebrating the new evangelization through our Eucharistic liturgy. So if you haven't seen that, I do uh, encourage you to check that out. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who in the power of the Holy Spirit have sent your word to announce good news to the poor, grant that, with eyes fixed upon him, we may ever live in sincere charity, made heralds and witnesses of his gospel in all the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, again, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar today. My name, as I said, is Jonathan Sullivan. I'm the Director of Catechetical Services for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. I'm also a member of the Technology Committee of the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership. I blog on catechesis and evangelization at my website, jonathanfsullivan.com. Uh, and I am married with a father of five, and we have another on the way in June. So uh, very exciting around our house right now. I'd like to thank the Adult Faith Formation Committee of the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership for sponsoring this webinar today and for uh, encouraging us to put this on and for the invitation to do so. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with them. I appreciate all of their help in putting all these materials together. The goal of our webinar today is to help parish catechetical leaders to use their parish's website and other online presences to support their efforts in adult faith formation. That's kind of uh, the real nugget of what we're trying to get at today, is to help you to use the tools at your disposal to engage the adults in your parish in their journey of discipleship. We're going to have two parts, or a, a number of parts to this webinar today. Uh, first, we're just going to take a look at evaluating your website. We're going to give some general consideration to what makes for a good parish website? What should you be looking for in your website that may or may not be there to ensure that it's going to be the most effective communication tool at your disposal? Then we'll look at some specific strategies for adult faith formation and your website. And we'll do that in three parts. We'll look at creating materials through your website, curating materials through your website, and communicating what you have available through your website. Then we're going to take a look at some live uh, internet examples of parishes that are doing a good job with some of those. And then, as I said, at the end, we will do some question and answers. I'll also mention this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss a piece, uh, that uh, link will be available to everyone once it is uh, posted online. We'll email that out to everyone who's registered today. Before we jump in, though, I just want to kind of answer the question, what do we mean by an engine? What does it mean uh, when we talk about using our website as an engine for adult faith formation, to, to power adult faith formation? If you think about an engine, an engine is something that creates energy, uh, but not just wild, unleashed energy that doesn't have a purpose. Engines serve a purpose. They get us to where we're going, or they power some sort of machinery that does something we need it to do. And so... That's kind of what, what I want us to keep in the back of our mind today, is that all of our communications, uh, whether they're paper, electronic, or whatever, 
any communications that come out of our parish should support our parish's mission. So we need to be clear on what is the mission of our parish. And when we speak specifically of adult faith formation, that purpose, of course, is to help the adults in our parishes on their journey of discipleship. So the distinction I want to make here is that the engine isn't the destination. You can have the prettiest, most advanced website in the world, but it, if it isn't working towards your mission, if it isn't working towards the purpose uh, for which you have established your programs uh, and the different things that you do in your parish, then it's not really an effective engine. It, the engine is there to help us to get to where we want to go. So the web and websites are not a substitute for the kind of face-to-face -face interaction that we all know is so important, that kind of face-to-face -face evangelization, face-to-face -face catechesis. Uh, the web doesn't substitute for any of that. Those things are still important. That having been said, the web is an ideal way to supplement your efforts and to communicate your efforts in those other methods. Uh, it can provide opportunities for folks with limited schedules to engage in adult faith formation on their own terms or, or to even supplement uh, the things that people who are very involved are already doing. Uh, a nice way to kind of just plug in where they're available uh, throughout their day by getting online and seeing what kind of resources are available. So that's what we mean when we talk about the, the website as an engine or powering your adult faith formation efforts, that it's there to uh, bring energy and creativity and uh, movement to your efforts so that you can fulfill your purpose at your parish for adult faith formation. So let's talk about evaluating our parish websites. And I've got a, a number of different uh, criteria here we're going to talk just briefly about. Uh, when you're looking at your website, and I understand that as catechetical leaders in parishes, most of you probably don't have uh, direct control over your website. You're not the one designing it. Uh, sometimes you're not even the person who's updating the material on it. But I think these are good tips to keep in mind, good criteria to keep in mind, so that when you're engaged in those conversations with whoever your webmaster is, that you can say, you know, here's kind of what I want to look at when I'm developing my portion of the site. Uh, these are the kind of... Uh, design elements and things like that that I want to be aware of so that the website is going to be the most efficient tool possible. So what does a user-friendly site look like? What does a site that's going to be the best communication tool possible look like? First of all, it's going to have clear communication. And there's a number of things that this includes. It means that important items should be easy to find. Now, uh, those of you who've heard me uh, in presentations before or have listened to some of my other webinars, You'll know that my, my biggest complaint, uh, my biggest pet peeve when it comes to parish websites is the fact that mass times can be so hard to find. And uh, you know, that's probably the number one thing that people are going to be going to your website to look for is what time are your masses or what time do you offer the sacrament of reconciliation and so on. Uh, don't make people go looking for that information. Uh, you know, my recommendation is always put that right front and center on the front page of your website. Don't even put it in a menu item. Don't make people go looking for it, because if people can't find what they're looking for, if those important items aren't easy to find, it's much more likely they're just going to click out of it and look for another church's website to see if they can find that information that they're looking for. The same goes with important phone numbers and email addresses. Uh, you know, that staff directory, if you have that on your website, should really be easy to find and easy to use so that people can contact the people that they need to. And also the physical address and or directions to your church. Uh, you know, I always recommend the, the physical address and at least some basic contact information should usually be either at the top or the bottom of each page of your website. Uh, in web design, that's kind of where we've trained people to look for those things. So if you can put those things in a place that's going to be easy to find, it's going to really help people. And if your parish is difficult to locate, if it's kind of on a side street or something like that, you know, make sure you list a, a cross street or something like that, a, a good landmark that's going to help people to be able to find you even easier. Next, use the language of the people. Um, you know, the website isn't a place for heavy theological jargon, heavy theological language, the kind of stuff that the, the vocabulary and words that we use professionally as catechetical leaders, that's not the place for the website. So you know, when you think about what to call you know, your particular, particular section of the website, use language like faith formation rather than catechesis because then people are going to know what it is that they're looking for. If you're using words or jargon that people aren't familiar with, again, it's going to be harder for them to find what they're looking for on the site. So you know, don't obfuscate where your material is being held because you're using language that isn't familiar with people. Now that having been said, if your uh, parish has done a really good job in, in training people in theological language, you know, 
go for it. That's fine. But again, make sure that it's going to be easy for folks who may be new and aren't familiar with that. Um, make sure that you're supportive of the outsider who may be looking at your parish website for the first time, maybe looking for a parish in the area. Um, make it easy for them to identify what they're looking for so that they know what you have to offer. Uh, second big point, uh, make sure your information is up to date. And, you know, uh, again, I'm, I, it's kind of silly that we need to talk about this in 2013, but the fact is that we still have a lot of parish websites that I see, at least, that the information's out of date or, uh, you know, you might see a, a picture gallery that includes an event from, you know, two years ago on the front page of the website. You know, if, if the website doesn't look like it's being updated on a regular basis, if, if the information isn't fresh and new, people are going to assume that it's not being updated and they just won't come back because the information that they're looking for isn't there. They're going to be uh, less inclined to come back if that information isn't constantly being refreshed and up to date. And again, that has to do with mass times. Uh, you know, one of the uh, most embarrassing things that ever happened to me was I was fairly new to an area and I was looking for a mass and looked up on a parish website what time the masses were and wound up showing up uh, in the middle of a homily because the parish had changed their mass times and they hadn't updated their website to reflect that. Um, you know, that's never a way to make people feel welcomed and invited into a parish, as if you're giving them the wrong information. Next, uh, a user-friendly website is going to have beautiful design. And that's a fairly subjective thing, but you want to make sure that your pages aren't just, you know, blocks of text. We want to use images. We want it to be fairly uncluttered. Again, it goes back to being easy to find. Uh, part of that, too, is being aware of how best to write for the web. Writing for websites is a little different from writing a magazine article or writing a newsletter or things like that. Uh, websites, uh, good websites tend to have very short blocks of text. There's not going to be long paragraphs. Judicious use of bulleted lists. The idea is to make it easy to skim because that's how people tend to read websites, is not word for word. Typically, they're looking for something specific on a page, and so they're going to skim the page to look for what specific information they're looking for. So having good headers, having bulleted lists, things like that makes it easy to skim so people can find what they're looking for and then move on. You also want to make sure you have a fairly simple color palette on your website, not a whole lot of colors. Uh, usually, you know, three dominant colors in a website is usually enough. Uh, and if you have, you know, a parish uh, colors... Uh, that go with banners or anything like that, or a logo as part of your parish, you know, choosing the colors that are part of that really helps to make a cohesive design. So let's do a quick poll of everyone in the audience today to see what you think about your own website. Uh, now, this is going to be anonymous, so feel free to be uh, honest in what you think about your website. We won't be able to uh, match any names or locations or anything with your answers. So on your screen right now should be uh, that poll. Let us know. Do you not have a website? That's an option there uh, for the top option there. Uh, is your website a one? Maybe it's broken or irregularly updated. Is it a two? It's kind of on maintenance mode. You know, no one's really thinking much about it except to update every once in a while. Is it a three? You use your site, but it could be better. Or is it a four? Your website's a lean, mean uh, community building machine. Uh, just choose your option there. We'll give folks a few more seconds to take their pick. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll. And let's take a look at our results here. It looks like about 1% of you don't have any parish website at all. 10% uh, have a website, but it's, it's not real good. It's broken or not updated regularly. 15%, it's on maintenance mode. 66% have a site. Um, they use it well, but it could be better. That's actually a much higher number than I was expecting. I'm, I'm fairly impressed there. And 8% uh, say you have a really great uh, website that you're using for your parish. Well, that's great. That's very encouraging. Um, you know, again, in my work, I get to see a fair number of parish websites, and some are better than others. Uh, 
But uh, that's really encouraging to hear that uh, the websites in most of your parishes are doing really well. And as I said, you know, we'll give you some tips here uh, for those of you who maybe aren't real happy with the website, some tips that you can take to your webmaster or maybe your pastor to, to talk a little more about how to make them better. All right. So next, let's talk about some specific strategies for using our websites for adult faith formation. Now, as I said, we're going to do this kind of in three parts. And that first part is about creating resources. Uh, you know, that's always really nice to do if you can, is to actually create personalized resources for your parish, for your parishioners. Uh, and the great thing is that that's really easier than ever before right now. Uh, the tools for creating good multimedia resources have just gotten more available, cheaper uh, over the past few years. Things like cheap video cameras, you can now buy you know, a little point and click video camera for about you know, anywhere from $75 to $100 uh, at the starting end. And these are just little flip cameras, was kind of the original version, and now all sorts of companies have these. But the idea is it's, it's just a point and click video camera. So you just hold it in your hand, click the start button, and it records whatever you've got. And then you can just plug them right into your computer. And they usually have options to upload directly to YouTube. Some very simple editing options if you want to be able to clip some stuff out. Uh, but you know, nothing that really takes a whole lot of uh, time or effort to learn. Uh, these tools have really gotten very easy to use, which has been a, a really uh, great thing for catechesis. And you know, something as simple as if you're familiar with Father Robert Barron's YouTube videos, uh, you know, it's just really him sitting talking. You know, there's not a whole lot of uh, big production value behind it, although he's certainly added some uh, as he's gone on. But just being able to just sit and talk and let people see someone who's talking about the faith and engaging them in the faith is really interesting. Some more gen general guidelines than when creating uh, these sorts of resources. First of all, keep in mind to respect copyrights. Uh, you know, I still see, unfortunately, in, in PowerPoint presentations and other presentations out there, uh, folks using copyrighted images uh, without having gotten permission, things like that. Uh, in fact, just a couple of months ago, I was watching a webinar and. Uh, you know, one of the images in the PowerPoint had a big watermark across it, which pretty clearly marked it as a copyright image. You know, we really need to be careful about not violating, violating copyright law, being respectful of the property of others. You know, that's one of the, the uh, principles of Catholic social teaching is that people have a right to their property. And so stealing images from online, uh, you know, isn't something we want to encourage or really be seeing in our parishes. Second, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, if you know, you're thinking about creating a resource and you found someone else who's basically done what you were thinking about doing, you know, direct people towards that or ask if you can use uh, that in your parish. Uh, you know, there's still kind of a mentality in some places uh, that if something wasn't invented here, we're not going to use it, even if it is exactly what we need. Uh, you know, we need to be willing sometimes to take ideas that we didn't come up with and use them. Uh, you know, there's lots of great ideas and the internet now especially has open up vast ways for us to be able to share ideas and to share information. Uh, it's one of the primary reasons I, I'm so involved on Twitter is because people are constantly sharing resources and ideas for catechesis and faith formation. And so we don't have to just go it alone. Uh, there's lots of ways now that we can collaborate with one another to build up these things. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, you know, if we're just reinventing the wheel, then it's really a waste of time and resources. And we're not being good stewards uh, if we're not willing to see that other people are uh, doing things that we could be piggybacking on. And then finally, find help. Uh, there's probably plenty of knowledgeable, eager to assist individuals in your parishes who know how to use these tools, can help you with uh, setting up an audio recording for homilies or setting up video creation, things like that. Uh, and the first place I would recommend looking actually is probably in your youth group. Uh, youth you know, are, are growing up with these tools. We sometimes hear the phrase digital natives thrown around. Uh, you know, these, these young people now are growing up with these tools and it's a part of their everyday lives. Uh, so they can show you how to create videos on a cell phone or uh, how to set up a texting service uh, for your parish. So go out and find the people who have that knowledge, who have that enthusiasm and passion for those sorts of things and get them on board to help out. So some real concrete suggestions now of things that you can do to create 
resources for your parish. First of all, record a talk or a homily. Uh, the idea would be to do that in video. Again, if you have one of those cheap little video cameras or something like that, uh, as often as I can, whenever I go out and give presentations, I try to bring a camera along with me to record it and then put it up on YouTube and other services so that folks can benefit from that. Uh, and for parishes, I think that's especially important. If you have a parish mission or if your pastor is giving some sort of speaker series, uh, you know, being able to record that and share it with folks who maybe the time or the date didn't quite work for them uh, is really a great way to reach out to those folks so that they can still be involved, can still get that great information. Now, obviously, it's important to get permission first from whoever's doing the speaking. Uh, you don't just want to you know, set up a camera without asking first, uh, so make sure you do that. But in my experience, uh, more and more speakers are getting very, very willing to allow folks to record them and share that online. Uh, we do a, a big catechetical conference in our diocese every two years and this past year we had oh, you know around 20 speakers or so and I think only one of them uh, said no when we asked if we could record them and, and share it with folks so uh, it never hurts to ask all they can say is no uh, but it's a great way to be able to share the things that are going on in your parish next start a blog uh, and you know we sometimes think of blogs as just being out there for parishes to you know talk about upcoming events or things like that, but think about creating a reflective blog. You know, invite a few parishioners you know who uh, write well or have really good conversion stories or have some sort of real deep understanding of the faith and invite them to start a blog. Uh, it could be something as simple as just, you know, try it out for Advent or Lent. Ask some people to write daily reflections based on the daily scripture readings or on uh, some other aspect of the liturgical season. And then, you know, ideally if, you, if you're going to do it like that, have them do it beforehand so that you can load it into the blog and it just shows up every day so you've got it all preloaded. Uh, but even then, you know, just setting something up and asking a few people to contribute to it on a regular basis, sharing their thoughts maybe about uh, the liturgical season or uh, something about the pastor's latest homily, something like that, and then invite people to come. And the great thing about it is people can comment on the blog. And so then you start to get into that dialogue which is always fun to see. Uh, it's not just people sharing their thoughts, but it's then people responding and adding to and pointing people in new directions. Uh, and obviously you want to moderate those because uh, you, know, you don't want conversations to go all awry, uh, but there's very simple ways to do that in most blogging software nowadays. Now again, that's something you can ask your webmaster to set up for you, is to ask if it's possible to set up a blog on your website, if for whatever reason that isn't possible. Uh, you know, there's plenty of third-party sites now like WordPress.com or Blogspot where you can set up free blogs that you can make available to folks. Uh, my, the only caveat I always give with that is check with your parish or your diocese beforehand to see what sort of social media guidelines they have. Uh, a lot of dioceses now are establishing social media policy, so just make sure that you're following whatever the policy or procedures are for your area. So we've covered creating. Let's talk a little bit about curating resources. Uh, a lot of parishes nowadays will have a, a links page or different pages with links to other online resources. Uh, I see a lot of parishes nowadays have you know, just a page of adult faith formation links. We always want to be careful when we talk about that idea of curation. And if that's not a term that's familiar to you, think of it as a museum curator. The job of a museum curator is to decide what gets displayed. Most museums, you know, have huge collections that, unfortunately, you know, we, we don't often get to see. They're back in storage and things like that. The curator's job is to go through those vast collections and choose the good stuff or choose the stuff that's going to be most interesting to the local community and put those on display. They don't put the entire collection on display. They don't put everything out there, but they make decisions. Uh, they make prudential judgments about what's going to be most appropriate to the folks they're trying to reach. Another way to think about it is as an editor. Uh, it's an editor's job to uh, decide what goes in, what goes out of uh, a newspaper or magazine or things like that. So this idea of curation is about looking at what is available, but then deciding what you're actually going to promote. And that can include lots of different things. So one of the things that that implies then is that we're going to be doing some sort of evaluation, that we're going to not just take everything that comes at us and put it out there for folks, but we're going to make decisions about what's going to go out there and what isn't. So 
what does it mean to evaluate an online resource? And obviously, there's all sorts of resources out there around faith, around the church, around uh, issues involving religion. Some very, very good, some not so very, very good. So here's kind of my guidelines, some four simple questions to ask when you're looking at a particular resource to decide, is this something that I want to promote? Is this something that I'm comfortable passing on to the folks in my community? And the first question is, is it official? Uh, obviously, you know, we're going to give greater credence to something that comes from the Vatican or the USCCB or our local diocese than from something that comes from uh, St. Joe Blow halfway across the country. Um, you know, that idea that there's official resources coming out from these different uh, levels of the church, you know, implies that there's already been some, uh, some editing, some curating going on. And so I think we can always feel fairly confident in putting anything out there uh, that's in, from an official source. The second is, do they have a good track record? Um, you know, maybe it's not from an official source, but it's from a diocesan official or a Catholic author or something like that. Is this a person that has a history of putting out good things? Is this a, someone who has uh, something to back up why they're putting these things out there? Uh, and again, you know, this is going to involve some prudential judgment, but uh, you know, if it's someone that you know and have liked their materials from before, um, you know, yeah, you're going to give that a little more credence than to something that's just brand new. And obviously that goes for publishers as well. I mean, there's plenty of great Catholic publishers out there that we can feel fairly confident in promoting. Third, is it faithful to the fullness of the church's teaching? Uh, this is one that always kind of gets me in particular. There's, there's plenty of stuff out there that, you know, follows church teaching and isn't false, but maybe overemphasizes one aspect of the faith to the detriment of another. Uh, you know, a, a lot of spiritual resources out there that promote one way of uh, living the Catholic life, things like that. Uh, I am, in, in my ministry here in our diocese, I'm much more interested in things that are going to promote the broadness of the Catholic faith. Uh, you know, the, the joke I always like to kind of use is, is this something that's going to appeal to both a Jesuit and a Dominican? Uh, uh, you know, is it something that's going to respect the wide variety of ways of being Catholic that are out there? Uh, you know, so it's not just really narrowly focused in one band of the church's tradition, but is it something that's really going to be respectful of that fullness uh, of the faith? And then the last one is, does it pass the smell test? Uh, and this is just, you know, it, it's something you kind of hone over the course of your years and looking at resources and things like that. Uh, my guess would be most of you are actually pretty good at doing this. Is You know, does it just kind of feel right or does something just kind of feel off about it? Uh, does it just not quite line up with what we're trying to promote in our office or in our parish, things like that. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to just pass on something just because it doesn't quite feel right. It may come back later and suddenly, you know, you see a, a new aspect to it and understand that it's going to be great. That's happened to me a number of times where I've just kind of sat on resources to think about them a little bit before I pass them on and make sure that's the right time to pass them on. So that's one thing to think about when we're curating resources. It's really looking at what it is we're going to pass on, evaluating it. Uh, and as I said, these are just kind of four questions I like to ask whenever I'm doing that. I, I think they might be helpful to you. Next, uh, keep it limited in what you're putting out there. Again, this goes back to the idea of the museum curator. They're not just throwing everything out there, but they're being judicious about it. Uh, they're helping people to find the good stuff. And so that means limiting the amount of stuff we're putting out there. And again, if you kind of think of a, a, an adult faith formation resource list on a parish website or something, you know, it, it's very easy to make that just go on and on and page after page after page of links and resources and things like that. But at some point, you know, there's kind of a a tipping point where that doesn't become helpful anymore. Uh, psychologists use the phrase decision paralysis. When people have too many choices, when they have too many options, it can actually keep us from choosing any one of them. Uh, my wife likes to talk about, uh, you know, she hates going to the ketchup aisle in the grocery store because there's just so many choices. Uh, you know, just having one or two choices sometimes is much better than giving 50 or 75 or 100. It's a little counterintuitive. But again, it, it helps people to find the good stuff and make good decisions and be able to make a decision because you're, you've already done some of that paring down for them. And then finally, keep it fresh. Update uh, these sorts of things regularly. If you've got a list of links on your website or something like that, 
check it, you know, every six months or so uh, might be a, a good time frame to do that, just to make sure that, number one, the links are still working. Uh, there's nothing worse than going to a resource page and discovering that half the links don't work anymore because the resources have been moved or shut down or something like that. Uh, so you want to just, just physically making sure that the links are still good links, but also to make sure that whatever you're, you're pointing people towards is, is still relevant, still correct, still uh, timely. Uh, and, you know, this Year of Faith it would be a good example of that. We've been putting out a lot of resources for the Year of Faith in our diocese, pointing people towards it. But, you know, at some point, those aren't going to be as timely anymore once we're out of the Year of Faith. A few months after that, maybe time to start thinking about kind of taking those down and then be, being ready to promote whatever's going to come next. So uh, being aware that our, our our job of curating these resources is, is very important. Whatever we're going to put out there, you know, we really need to be able to stand behind it. It really needs to be helpful to folks. Uh, and not just you know throwing anything at the wall and seeing what sticks, but really being judicious in what we put out there is really going to be to the most benefit of our parishioners. So we've done creating, we've done curating. Let's talk a little bit about communicating. We can put all the best resources out there in the world, but if nobody knows about them, it's not going to do much good for anyone. So when we're speaking specifically of our website, I always like to think of our websites as being kind of the hub of our internet presences online. Uh, they should kind of stand in the middle of everything that we do. Uh, we can kind of even draw a little diagram here. If we think about the website in the middle, and then maybe your parish has a Facebook page, or maybe it has a Twitter account, or possibly a YouTube account, something like that. All these sorts of little satellite or ancillary web services. You know, ideally, all of these things should kind of be feeding into one another and directing folks to whatever it is you're really wanting to promote your website. But all this stuff should be feeding into the website so that when you have a new YouTube video up, you, know, you should be embedding that into your website somewhere. You should have a, a list of all those things there. Uh, when you're sharing a resource on Facebook, maybe you, know, you also put that on Twitter, uh, directing people towards that resource on your website. Uh, the website sits in the middle of all of that and is really the the home base for all of your online activities. Uh, people may enter into those things through Twitter, maybe they find you there first, or maybe they find you on Facebook, but eventually they're going to be drawn to your website, uh, and that's where most people are really going to uh, first interact with you online. So it, it becomes kind of that central uh, place where all these things feed into and direct people towards so they can find that best, most up-to-date information. So as I said, part of that also then is utilizing social media, that if you're putting new resources onto your website or you've added uh, curated items to your list, you know, post those things to Facebook, post those things to Twitter, let people know, we've got a new resource over here, and put the link there so that people can go to it. Um, you know, most people... You know, for most people, their parish website isn't a destination spot. It's not someplace they're checking in every day. But almost everyone who's on Facebook checks in there on a pretty regular basis. And so if you're putting these links out there on Facebook or Twitter or other places where people are already linked in, then that's how they're really going to communicate and find out what's new on your website. So you want to make real good use of that social media. Uh, use it to remind folks about the stuff you've put up there in the past. You know, maybe they missed it on Facebook the first time around. So every once in a while, just throw up, hey, you know, we put this up a, you know, a couple of months back. It's something that you may still be interested in. Uh, especially you know, when it's been updated, things like that. Maybe you use an email service. There's lots of great email services now that you can plug in if you've got a blog or, or things like that that will plug into those things and automatically email folks when there's updates there. Uh, there's lots of services out there like Constant Contact or MailChimp or, or Flocknote is a service that was specifically built for Catholic parishes. So you might want to explore those things, see what kind of services they offer, see if that would be a good way to communicate the resources that are available. Play a video after Mass. Uh, you know, I, we, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Cathedral Parish here in Springfield, Illinois, and we did a huge renovation on our cathedral a couple of years ago and added on a beautiful atrium space. And it's got a huge screen, a wonderful drop-down projector. And I've often wished, you know, lots of people pass through that space after Mass every Sunday. Wouldn't it be great, you know, for us to create a video or 
just preview a video or something on that screen as people are walking through. You know, maybe it's something like uh, you're going to be offering Father Barron's Catholicism series uh, as a program over a number of weeks. Maybe you throw up just a little preview of that uh, after Mass on Sunday. Now, maybe you don't have a big screen and a big atrium space or something like that, but you could certainly set up a TV with a DVD playing or something like that with a table with information, someone sitting there so they can uh, explain and, if needed, you know, register folks for those programs. But give people a little taste of what you're going to be offering if that's uh, something that's going to be available as a media thing that you can uh, play after Mass. And then finally, ask your followers to share. And this is really kind of the uh, sweet spot when it comes to social media, is things like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all these different services have built into the methods by which people can share what you have posted with others. Facebook is a really good example of that. Uh, on every, If you've got a, a page for your parish on Facebook, everything you put up there has a little share link on it. And anyone who's following your page can click that share button. And then it gets posted to their page so that everyone that they're friends with now is seeing that information. And people can just continue to share these things. So when you can get people on your side, get people to start helping to communicate with folks they're connected with, uh, you know, that's uh, really, like I said, the sweet spot of social media. And what I like to tell people is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask people, hey, share this. You know, we really want a lot of people to know about this. Uh, you know, retweet it or... Uh, put it on your Facebook profile, things like that. Don't be afraid to ask uh, for people to share your thing so it gets out there to a wider audience than you have access to even. So uh, those are kind of the three main strategies, uh, the creating, the curating, and the communicating. Now we're going to take a look at some uh, examples of parishes that are doing a good job at this. Uh, as always, uh, a quick caveat, this is the live internet. Uh, we will be going uh, to the actual web pages themselves. So, um, I, you know, I just always like to warn people, it's always possible on the live internet something may flash up that uh, it's inappropriate or something like that. I, I've never had that happen, but since we're live on the internet, just <laughs> want to say if that does, does happen, my apologies, and I'll get it off the screen as quickly as possible. So there's four things that I want to take a look at here. The first is St. Clement Parish in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, they have a great list of staff-recommended resources. If you go to their learning tab, down here they have some staff-recommended resources, and this is a great example of a curated list. Uh, they've done a really nice job of categorizing, a really nice job of keeping it simple. It's not overwhelming. It's not a whole lot of information. Uh, but they've got it very nicely segmented out here. They have some book resources for adults they recommend. Uh, they've got some websites that they recommend. Uh, apps, I love this. Uh, you know, if your resource list doesn't include some good Catholic apps for phones and iPads and things like that, you know, make sure you add that because every day it seems there's another great Catholic app that's coming out uh, for folks to use. And, you know, we all know, you know, cell phones uh, really aren't phones anymore. They're really pocket computers. And... People are really using them now to, to stay connected with the things they're interested in. Uh, they've even got a couple of uh, Twitter links up here, some folks they recommend that you follow on Twitter, including uh, the Pope, the U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops, uh, Father James Martin, uh, and then uh, some great books for children and families to read together. And that's an, uh, I love seeing that on this list, You know that it's not just about you as an adult, but how are you passing on the faith to your family. Uh, I especially love that they have the clown of God there at the top of their list. That's I know one of my... Uh, my children's favorite books, and one I love to read with them over and over again. So this is a great uh, example of a curated list uh, here at St. Clement's. Uh, they also have a pretty nice page uh, for adult faith formation, again, under that learning tab. If you go there, I just describe the different things in, the different things they have to offer, uh, Bible studies, Catholicism series, theology on tap in the area. Uh, so, you know, they've done, again, a nice job of just kind of listing those things for folks to be able to see when they go to their website. The next site I want to take a look at is Holy Name of Jesus in Wayzata, Minnesota. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, they have a parish blog, and I love what they've done with this. And I really want to talk to the communications director for this parish, because uh, the way this sounds is that they have these little videos, and it sounds like maybe they play them after Mass. I'd love to know exactly how they're used uh, on Sundays. They have these little 60 seconds to connect videos. And it looks like every week they create a little video 
uh, that just highlights what are some of the events coming up in the coming week. And they have their communications director just kind of, it's a, a little shot of her. She talks about it, and they throw the information up on the screen there so that people know. What a great way to present this information in a new and a little more dynamic way than just having it in the bulletin. And I'm not an advocate for getting rid of bulletins or anything like that, but uh, for folks who want to get this information in a slightly different manner, uh, what a really neat way to, to put a fresh face on what you know can be really dry announcements or, or bulletin inserts. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to uh, contact uh, their communications director and find out how these things are used. I, I really like this idea and then putting it up on the blog here for folks to be able to see. Next is St. Paul the Apostle Parish in Westerville, Ohio. Uh, and they have, and uh, their pastor has been doing a, a series on church history and the Second Vatican Council, and they've recorded all of those, which again is a great way to be able to share that information with folks. And so if you click on that, it actually goes here to the page, and it looks like they've got handouts. Uh, they've got an MP3 that people can download and listen to on their computer or on their MP3 player uh, and take it with them on the go. Uh, you know, that's another thing. Uh, that's something we didn't see on that curated list before is uh, Catholic podcasts. And there's, you know, a great number now of Catholic podcasts now that people can go and listen to uh, in their free time. I'm a big advocate of podcasts myself. Uh, one of my chores in our household is I do the dishes after dinner, and you know once uh, I kind of got plugged into podcasts, you know I made that a, a much nicer chore. I actually kind of look forward to it now. So I just plug in my headphones and I get to listen to great speakers and uh, conversations from folks talking about all sorts of interesting subjects while I'm doing the dishes. So again, you know, asking permission of your presenters, you know, can we record this and offer it? Like I said, video is great. Uh, but, you know, in the absence of that, audio is certainly wonderful as well. And if you can even offer both as options, you know, that then you're really giving people choices for how best they want to listen uh, or watch those presentations. Uh, also, I, I'm not going to click on the link here, but they also have PDFs of all the homilies for this parish. So both the pastor and the deacon uh, have the text of their homilies for every week that people can go if they had to miss or I mean they're out of town or something like that they can go and and get what that message was for the week so that's a, another really great uh, resource that's being offered here by St. Paul the Apostle and then the last one and uh, this isn't just at my own horn but uh, my diocese's Facebook page uh, you know we've been really making effort to use our Facebook page to promote events and to engage people in uh, faith formation. So again, you know, we post lots of links up here to different blogs and and people who are doing interesting things. The USCCB does a wonderful job on Facebook. You know, I'm, I'm I'll take any time I can to to commend the work they've been doing. Their Facebook page is wonderful, and so we often share things that they're putting out there. Uh, in this case, right now, you can even see up here in the top, we're using this profile picture right now, the large uh, scale picture, to promote our bishop's new book. He's just written a book called Holy Goals for Body and Soul. Uh, so we're, we're helping to promote that through our Facebook page by making sure it's good and prominent. But one of the wonderful things I love to do on our page, and this is something we've been doing for a few years now, is just asking very simple faith questions uh, on our Facebook page. And so right here you can even say, you know, just this morning we, we posted, what are you grateful for today? And we just invite people to share their response to those questions. And this is probably the, the question that gets the, the most responses ever uh, of all the questions we've tried. So people, you know, for our priests, for the people who quietly do God's work behind the scenes, uh, that I get paid to do what I do. I have the best job in the Curia. That's from our, our director for the missions. Uh, grateful for faith and family. You know, just a real nice opportunity for folks to just take a few seconds Think about their faith a little bit. Think about what they're grateful for to God, and then share that with others. Uh, and like I said, you know, people really share wonderful things. In the past, we've had people share about, uh, you know, family family members being uh, overcoming sickness and being healed, and, and things like that. So, using these little opportunities that we have through our uh, social media, through our websites, and things like that, just to give people a little moment in the day where they can they can plug into those questions, uh, is another wonderful way to just help people to be empowered and energized in their adult faith formation. So th those are just four little examples of uh, ways that various places are using the Internet and using uh, online tools to do adult faith formation. 
So with that, we are going to take some questions. We've got about, uh, well, just about 13 minutes left for Q&A, so that should give us some time to get through a number of questions. Um, I'm probably going to avoid any technical questions about websites. Uh, I used to do web design a, a while back, but it's been a long time, and so I'm not <laughs> really familiar with some of the more modern uh, uh, questions that folks might have. But as I said before, you can open up the GoToMeeting control panel, and that will open up uh, the question panel there. And if your control box is closed, just click the orange arrow to open it up, and we will go through uh, any of these questions. How many admins do you recommend to keep Facebook and parish websites fresh? That's a great question. Um, you know, it depends on the size of your parish, depends on um, how much you have going on. Uh, I would recommend uh, at least three is kind of the recommend, recommendation our diocese has been put out there. Uh, the, you know, the pastor should definitely have login uh, credentials to any online uh, things that might be going on. Uh, but then usually, you know, my recommendation is if you can, if the whatever website software you're using can handle it, would be to uh, put that information uh, or to put the login information to specific people to be able to access their specific pages. So if you have a section for adult faith formation or catechesis, you know, the DRE ideally should be able to log in and make those updates, mainly because then that it, it keeps down the amount of uh, steps it takes to update a site. If you've got a webmaster who's the only person who has control over all of that, then you have to give them that information, uh, wait for them to put it up, uh, make sure that they put it up correctly. Uh, you know, it just it adds time, it adds steps to all of that. Uh, so, that, you know, it's just something you want to be aware of is that the more uh, that people can have access to what they can uh, want to be able to do, uh, that's going to be the best way to do that. How can you best support a bilingual parish with information through the website? That's a great question. Um, who, you know, um, we're a fairly rural diocese, so it's not a question we come up against a whole lot. We've got a few parishes in our diocese that uh, have a significant Hispanic population. You know, I, ideally, again, would be to have that information available in both languages. Uh, you want to be able to get that information to as many people as possible. And as I said, the idea is to make it uh, as easily accessible as possible so that uh, uh, you know, they don't have to struggle to, to find that information. So whether that means having two separate sites uh, with information in each language or whether it's one site and each page has that information in both languages, um, you know, I haven't seen any information on which of those would be best. Just thinking ecclesiology, uh, my preference would probably be to have one site and just have each page with that information in both languages, just to represent the fact that it's one parish, um, that that information is available to all folks. Have you seen a successful way to allow prayer requests to be submitted online? Uh, yeah, you know, one of my favorites is uh, actually the Archdiocese of St. Louis has a really nice uh, prayer request form on their website. And it's just, you know, it's just a simple kind of contact form uh, like you see on a lot of websites. Uh, but it goes to a, a community of sisters there. So just something as simple as that as just having a contact form that's specifically for prayer requests. Uh, that way... Folks can just type those in, and whether those are printed out and prayed over every week or uh, you know, stored electronically, you know, that's kind of going to depend on the setup you have in your particular parish. But uh, uh, yeah, just a simple contact form like that would be the, the easiest way to do that. Uh, follow up on the bilingual question, should it be side by side on each page or a full page for each language with an English or Spanish button? Uh, wow, you know, the, the English-Spanish button wouldn't be a, a bad idea. Uh, that's going to get a little more technical in terms of the implementation uh, for the website software that you're using. Uh, you know, 
you know, if you're limited in your ability to do things like that, you know, the side by side or you know having uh, one on top and one on bottom, something like that. Uh, again, you know, it's going to kind of depend on what the website uh, software that you're using is going to allow you to do. Wow, lots of great great questions. We're having trouble keeping up here. <laughs> Shouldn't there be a caution to opening up availability to website pages to people who know what they are doing? Sometimes when the burden is put on each department, the site becomes dated or inconsistent because not everyone knows how to write for a website, etc. Absolutely. And, you know, you, if you're going to empower people to do that, you're going to want to uh, make sure that they have good training on how to do that. Give them some training on how to... Uh, write for the web, on how to use the specific website software that you're using, etc. cetera. Uh, so, yeah, again, it's, it's going to depend on your parish and what you have available to you and the, the staff and everything like that. Um, you know, and you may have some folks who just aren't comfortable do it with doing it themselves, in which case, you know, having that webmaster there who's able to do it for them or help to walk them through it uh, can be a real help. Can you use volunteers effectively to help with the site and social media? How does the staff control the quality? Um, <laughs> absolutely. I, I would say, you know, volunteers are a great way to go that route. Uh, we don't want to put all this burden just on uh, paid staff for a parish, especially if it's a smaller parish that doesn't have a, a large staff available. Uh, the, the quality control, I would say, is by controlling the quality of your volunteers, uh, making sure that you're choosing folks who are going to be uh, responsible and have a good sense for the parish and what's going to be appropriate for the parish. Uh, and that's why having multiple administrators is always important. Uh, again, something like a Facebook page, you know, you want to have multiple administrators for that Facebook page so that uh, if in case you know, a, a volunteer or someone, even a paid staff member, does put something up that may be inappropriate or not reflective of what the parish wants to put out there, that someone else can go in there, delete that, uh, and remove the administrative privileges for the other person. The other reason that's important is, you know, God forbid if someone should die or have something happen to them, if that person has all the login credentials, then no one else can go in and take care of those things. So yeah, absolutely, I, I encourage uh, having volunteers uh, have access to that and uh, just <laughs> make sure you're choosing good volunteers. Do you recommend parishes hire a communications director to manage Facebook, Twitter, blogs, uh, website videos, etc.? cetera? Uh, this seems like a full-time job. It certainly could be. Uh, you know, uh, if your parish has that ability, that, that would certainly be a great way to do it. Uh, obviously, not every parish is going to have the kind of resources to do that. And that's where having a good volunteer who uh, knows these things and is interested in it or at least can coach staff and pastors on how to do them well uh, would be very good. So, uh, yeah, if you have the resources for a communication director, you know, I think that can be a very valuable uh, position on any parish staff. But if not, you know, finding people who have that kind of expertise and asking for their help, uh, you know, is the other way to do it. <laughs> Someone mentioning, you know, a good thing for every parish to have is a style guide. I absolutely agree. Uh, a style guide, if you're not familiar with it, is just kind of a set of rules or guidelines for everything from the proper spelling of a parish's name to uh, what colors you're going to use in your logo or in your different materials to uh, how you format addresses. It's just kind of a, a basic guide for how we write things or how we present things in this parish. Uh, you know, that's, that's a really great kind of thing document to have and then that's something that you give to staff to say you know when you're writing the parish's name you know we spell out the word saint we don't do st period things like that and the value in that then is that your communications and the message that you're putting out there is consistent uh, people aren't confused by conflicting uh, presentations of your message but they know exactly what that looks like when it comes from you Where do you get a style guide for a parish website? Uh, you know, if you're speaking specifically of a website, that might be something your web designer can help you out with. Uh, ideally, you know, if you're either hiring a designer or getting someone to come and do some web design for you, you know, talking with them about colors, talking with them about logos, things like that, and then they can kind of help you to develop that document. If you're talking about an overall kind of parish thing, you know, that, that might be something that comes out of uh, a small committee or something like that to just make those kinds of decisions. Uh, you know, if you have a 
good active pastoral counsel. That could be questions for them. You know, how do we want to spell out the parish's name, things like that. So there's a number of ways you could go about there. Are there certain policies or regula regulations regarding using videos or photographs of parishioners that would have legal consequences? A lot of that's going to depend on what your local or diocesan guidelines or policy are. Uh, you know, uh, typically, you know, if someone's on your property, you can, and I'm not, let me say I'm not a lawyer, and so take this all with a grain of salt and consult your legal experts at, at your local place. Uh, but for most folks, it's going to be, uh, you know, if someone's on your grounds, you have the right to take a picture of them, et cetera. Now, obviously, that gets a little dicier when we start talking about uh, pictures of children and wanting to make sure that we're protecting uh, children in our parishes. The, the basic rule of thumb, in the absence of any directives or policy or anything from your parish or diocese, the, the best rule of thumb I've seen when it comes to pictures of children on the web is you never want three pieces of information about a child in the same place. And that's, you don't want their picture, their name, and their location uh, available to folks. Now, obviously, if you're posting a picture of someone online, you know, the picture's there, so we've already got that. If it's a picture that's connected with your parish, well, that's a location. Someone will know that this child is connected with this location. So that means we've already got those two pieces of information there. So what that practically means is if you're going to put a picture of a child up online, don't put their name with it. Don't identify children in the pictures that you put up on your Facebook page, on your Twitter account, on your website, etc. cetera. Uh, that's uh, the way you want to... Uh, help to protect them. Uh, before I spoke of a texting service, can I expand on that? Sure. A uh, texting service is a service that lets you uh, put in a short message or something that then is automatically texted uh, via phone to anyone who signed up for that service. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, a good example that we used in our diocese a couple of years ago when we were uh, awaiting uh, word on who our new bishop would be is we told people you know, we would text the announcement when it was available. And so we signed up with a service, and I, I, that wasn't through my office, so I don't know exactly who that was, what company we went through. Uh, but the idea was then people would sign up for the service, and we would uh, uh, text them you know, the announcement of who our new bishop was when that was made. And so uh, there's different services. Uh, Flocknote, I mentioned earlier, is a service that helps parishes with online communication. Uh, they do have a texting option as part of their service. So that's uh, one option you might want to take a look at. But there's lots of different places out there that do that kind of service as well. So explore your options. Find out what is going to be best for you. Well, we are right up against 2 o'clock now, and I do want to respect everyone's times, uh, you know, not going over. I will take a look at uh, all of these questions that have been submitted, and uh, if there are, uh, I will take them, and if there's lots of questions uh, that people are asking, I will post those as a Q&A on my website. Uh, I want to mention my website is jonathanfsullivan.com, and all of the websites we've looked at today and all of the resources and things I've mentioned, I will have links on my website. In fact, it's there right now. If you go there, uh, you'll be able to find all of that. I do note some people did not see the slides uh, as part of the presentation. I apologize for that. Um, I, a recording of this web webinar will be available on the website tomorrow, but if you go to my website right now, I do have all the slides there. Uh, so you can see all the slides that, uh, that you missed on the website right now. Again, that's jonathanfsullivan.com. So thank you all so much for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate your attention and your great questions. Uh, thank you so much, and God bless you in your catechetical ministries.